Um, and also during the process of felling them to get them away from the fire line, et cetera. So um, we hope this can kind of help from the strategic planning level too, when fire responders are making choices about where they might put fire line. Um, I think Kit will be talking more about that in a little while. So it was actually a little challenging to find out how many fire responder deaths and injuries have been caused by falling snags. I think we hear a lot about it, um, but I had to comb through these fire reports to find that there, there were probably six to eight fire responder deaths caused between 2009 and 2018. And I couldn't find any place where we really log the number of injuries, but I know there's quite a few more than that. So the hope with this data set is that by reducing exposure of fire responders and other field going personnel to snags, especially in areas where they have high density, we could reduce or prevent some of these injuries and fatalities. And then I'm gonna hand the mic to Kit. Thanks, Karen. So I'm gonna give just a little bit of background on kind of what led us to this point to wanna to put the effort in to try to produce a product like this. And so back in uh, 2013, 2014, there was a national wildfire coordinating, coordination group study that was commissioned to specifically look at the hazards that fire responders have to deal with. And it was looking at fatalities, it was looking at injuries. And one of the things that was interesting is that uh, unfortunately snag hazard or tree strikes was about the fifth highest likely cause of death on fires if you're a fire responder. People don't really think about that that much, but, um, and then if you look back at this, this 85 year history of fatalities on fires in, in the forest service, our agency has not gotten better at protecting our fire responders on fires. In fact, as the complexity has gone up, um, as we've had all of these kind of environmental hazards really accumulate, we're seeing even more fatalities. And so all of this led to this strategic discussion of why are we putting our fire responders in environmental risk before they even get out there to do their fire line, to actually do their, their jobs? And is there a way that maybe the decision makers, before they send folks out in the field, can have better information so that they are really assessing those risk risk trade-offs are they are they getting what they uh, what they're buying by putting their fire responders at risk um, so with that the the life first initiative uh, came out in 2015 and that immediately rolled into Karen next slide yeah so what this actually all kind of kicked off was this idea of a much more structured decision making framework. And that's where the risk management assistance program was, was born of this, uh, thinking about those uh, more strategic decisions, getting better information to decision makers. And it was this group of fire managers and scientists, analysts, and specifically agency leadership, the people that have to make the call on fires, uh, to deliver kind of a much more um, quantifiable approach to decision making on fires to really overlay uh, the best available science and analytics to, to improve decision making. This all rolled out in 2017, and both Karen and I worked um, here in Region 1 at the regional office on this, this large group of wildfires burning around 2017 in Missoula, uh, where the smoke was actually the worst it had been since, 2000, or since uh, 1910, actually. So it was terrible smoke inundation for us here. And unfortunately, also in 2017 in Region 1 on these specific five fires, there were two tree strike fatalities of fire responders. So it was a really a heightened concern for decision makers on these fires. They were, they were trying to understand how they could better quantify the hazard, the exposure that they were putting our, their, their responders into when they, were, when they were putting people out onto this very potentially very harmful landscape or, or uh, challenging landscape anyway. So we started kind of uh, looking around for, for data. Uh, what was the best data we could find that was locally applicable for decision making? And we started with the forest health protection program, aerial detection surveys, you know, anything we could think of that would map these fatality or these tree fatalities, I should say, these, these mortality events. And um, Region 1 is, is uh, unique in that it has um, a really cool digital uh, catalog that actually gets at that level of, of mortality. And it's based on land fire products to kind of give a sense of what's out there to start with. Um, but the challenge was that um, these data were up to 14 years old. And so we didn't know what was still standing on the landscape, what was still considered a, a, a hazard or not. Um, and also the spatial coverage uh, for the analysis they ran wasn't, wasn't that complete. Uh, but it happened all, just so happened also that the region had run some remote sensing work. 
Um, and so they had this VMAP product that was really trying to use um, aerial imagery to quantify uh, mortality uh, of, of, of trees. And we, we actually supplied these to incident command teams on the Rice Ridge fire. And unfortunately, if you can look at these two products, they're, they, they're not great agreement between them. Um, the hot colors are supposed to be high snag areas. The cool colors are low snag density areas. And the fire responders on the ground and the decision makers on the ground were looking at this saying, you know, we can't really make heads or tails of this. Um, thank you for trying, but try again. Um, let's move on to something better, uh, hopefully in the future. So uh, with that, Karen, let's try a slide advance. <laughs> oh, great. It's ignoring me again. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right. Even the escaping out of the presentation is not working at the moment. There we go. Well, we may just stay in this mode, even though I know it's not as pretty. Yeah, that's fine. This is my last slide, and then you can take over, and maybe it'll keep awake for your presentation. Um, in 2018, uh, we had the first opportunity for some new information. This is the Ferguson fire down just outside of Yellowstone, um, or sorry, not, not, not Yellowstone, just outside of Yosemite, other Y National Park, uh, in California, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And what was unique about this area was back around 2008, all the way up through about 2015, they had had these massive mount mountain pine beetle outbreaks. And they knew there was a lot of mortality in their conifer systems, but they also knew they had had this persistent drought. And so drought was actually killing off trees uh, just as effectively, unfortunately, as those bark beetles. So there was this large multiple year accumulation of mortality on this landscape and some real concern about snag hazard going into this very complicated fire. Um, so we started asking around, are there any local data products here? And here the Region 5 Remote Sensing Laboratory had something called eDART. Um, and eDART um, it is a, a change detection algorithm that uses remote sensing to look at a cumulative mortality over time or a cumulative disturbance, I should say, over time. And so they had kind of a, a beta product that they shared with us and thought, you know, this is probably the best we could do for tree mortality. And what we liked about it is it was a modeled product. So it brought in a lot of different information. Um, it, it allowed them to kind of use a bunch of processing steps um, to think about what was out there. Um, but also what it did is it actually mapped out really well with the aerial imagery. So if we actually looked at the, the spots underneath these red dots, oh yeah, that looks like a high mortality zone. So this was actually used in decision-making to try and keep fire responders out of harm's way as this fire was actively progressing across the landscape. Now, unfortunately, um, on the Ferguson fire, there were two fatalities of fire responders. Um, they were accidents in transportation. Uh, they weren't snag related, but it did kind of refocus the need for this understanding of the operating environment. Um, and the other thing that this product, this, this kind of decision making product that used snag hazard to, to keep some fire responders safe, safer, at least, um, was it created a national demand. Um, so for the first time, people were saying, oh, OK, this is something that's possible. Why don't we have this everywhere? And with that, I'll transition over to Karen. OK, now we're going to get into some sort of gory technical details of how we approached the problem. So the snag hazard map that we've been using recently is derived from the tree map 2016. Um, and when we were making the tree map, we didn't even have this use in mind. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what tree map is and how it uses your glorious land fire data uh, for just a moment here. So the tree map we made in response to the need for a national tree list or a map where you could click on any pixel there and get an actual list of the number of trees by size, species, um, and also whether they're live or dead. So this product is created. You're looking there at the, the results of a, a very long machine learning exercise where we matched up FIA forest plots. So that's from forest inventory analysis to land fire data. So we had about 2.8 billion pixels there in the results. And that's at the, the native 30 by 30 meter resolution from land fire and on the same grid as land fire. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how this process works, but in essence, it's looking for the most similar of those FIA plots, matching it up to each pixel. And in that little panel at the, the lower left there, I've zoomed into a part of the Mogollon Rim in Arizona. Um, each of those colors is a unique plot identifier. 
So you can see how there's kind of cluster along these elevational gradients um, into bands. So the project goal here was to take the sparse but detailed measurements that we have at the FIA plots. And you can go into their databases, you know, and get information on all kinds of things, including downwoody material, lichens, et cetera, et cetera, recent disturbance. So there's a treasure trove in there, but we only have those measurements at very sparse locations across the landscape. So we wanted to extrapolate those to unmeasured locations on the landscape so that we have that seamless detailed tree map information at all locations. So this is just kind of a toy example of how that works. Uh, we need two data sets here referred to as the reference data. That's the really detailed measurements from the FIA forest plots. And then we need information about the landscape everywhere. And obviously that's not gonna be as detailed, but we can get that in gridded landscape data from land fire. So for example, we use your precipitation, slope and vegetation group rasters. Um, and in this toy example, I'm showing just three variables, but it's obvious if you had a choice of just those two plots on the left, and you wanted to pick which one is better for that middle pixel, you're gonna go with number one, right? For example, that is a ponderosa pine pot plot. So we used a random forest machine learning methodology to, to go ahead and make that match, identify which one is most similar um, and assign it to that grid so that our output is a gridded map of forest plot identifiers. Now let's look at how land fire played a pivotal role in this. Um, we did this exercise in R for you, for those of you who um, care about which R package, we're using the YA impute package in R, a modified random forest approach. So in essence, it's can, uh, making just a whole bunch of decision trees with this data. So you'll remember a moment ago, I said we needed two data sets. There's the FIA reference plot data, and there's also the land fire gridded target data. And you can see a list here of all the things that we used from land fire. So we got location from the rasters. We used the three topographic variables of the elevation, slope, and aspect. Um, for vegetation, we used forest cover, forest height, and existing vegetation group. And since you're land fire aficionados, um, I'm going to point out that that was the, the vegetation group and not the vegetation type. Um, the group is a slightly broader classification. And we had to go to that because we didn't have enough FIA plots to fill uh, every single existing vegetation type. We also drew heavily on your biophysical variable rasters, a list of six of those there that we used, and the disturbance rasters. So from the disturbance rasters, I figured out disturbance year or time since disturbance and disturbance code. We didn't have that in the first tree map version. We didn't include disturbance. And uh, the very first snag hazard product was based on the tree map 2014 that didn't include disturbance. And we found that we weren't doing as good of a job at capturing tree mortality as we could if we included disturbance. So there was a lot of work to get that incorporated um, in later tree maps for this, this very application of snag hazard. So those are all the predictor variables I just listed off. Um, in random forest, you can have more than one response variable, which is kind of cool. Um, and we chose four. You can actually use response variables that are predictors nom nominally. So we use forest cover, forest height, existing vegetation group, and disturbance code. And that really boosted the accuracy for those uh, variables. So in short, tree map combines land fire and FIA to make a new data set, and it's leveraging the strengths of both land fire and FIA. So strengths of land fire, which you'll all well know, it's national. Uh, we get from that not only vegetation, but disturbance, topography, and biophysical data, and that's at pretty fine resolution. Um, and I really think those strengths of land fire were key to our success here. There's a lot of people trying to make similar data sets based on remotely sensed imagery alone. And that's a much harder job than if somebody like land fire has already mapped things like canopy cover and height for you. Uh, we also use the strengths of FIA, which is that it gives us that tree level detail at a network of plots that are measured using the same protocol, protocol across the country. So it's very consistent. So we combine those two so that we can produce a national model with tree level detail. So back to snag hazard, once you have the tree map, um, it's not that hard of a lift to get over to snag hazard. This is a rubric from our colleague, Chris Dunn, who is a, a co-author here, where he has used uh, two variables, snag density or the number of trees per hectare and the median snag height to produce a, a four, four class rating of snag hazard. 
So the rationale being it's more dangerous if you have more snags per acre. It's also more dangerous if those are taller because they have a longer reach. So you can see in that rubric from Chris at the right, that blue class is low. So that tends to be your lower, lower densities. And then as you're moving to the higher densities and higher heights, you're getting into the, the extreme classes. We also had a recently disturbed area um, class as well, which I'll talk more about in just a minute. OK, so we were able to do that. But how, how accurate was it? In order to figure that out, we used 2,889 FIA, 8, FIA plots not used in the, the tree map. So they were independent. And we overlaid those plots at their location. We overlaid those on the snag hazard raster. So what we wanted to know more or less is, does the snag hazard class that was attached to the validation plot, does that match its location on the ground? But this is a slightly harder problem than you would think because there is a spatial mismatch. So what I'm showing you on the right there is the, the layout of an FIA plot. They actually have four subplots. Uh, splayed, uh, there's three splayed around that kind of mid middle pixel or middle plot. So if you overlay that on a 30 by 30 meter raster, that's going to lay over about four to nine pixels. Um, so what we did here was we considered the classification correct if any of the pixels within the plot radius had the same class. And using that measure, we got an accuracy of 86.4%. This is what those snag hazard maps look like on the ground. This is an example in the Bitterroot Mountains, not too far from me in Montana. So at left, you can see those two different components of the classification, the snags per hectare and the snag height. Um, you can see how those kind of tend to, to group again along like elevational gradients. You also see a big pink blob there in the middle. That's a previously disturbed area. And unfortunately, we weren't able to map those in tree map because we needed an existing vegetation group and there wasn't one attached to that class. So those were left out of the tree map. So we just put that pink class on there to tell people, heads up, there's been a fire here recently, probably needs some more ground truthing, um, but you probably have high snag levels in there. And then on the right, you can see what that is uh, looks like when you classify it into the, the four classes that I talked about a moment ago. Then this area we had mostly low hazard, although you can see some, some bands and pockets of higher hazard. So that has been since updated by our colleague, Ben Gannon. So if you go onto the risk management assistance dashboard, uh, which is online, it has a bunch of really uh, cool intel in it besides this snag hazard layer, including some of uh, Kit's work on potential control lines and suppression difficulty and you can display, display those online in a browser. Um, so you can see one of the things Ben has done is fill in that pink blob that was there before. Um, he's gone ahead and applied uh, a linear model there to, to predict what that snag hazard class would probably be. And he's also updated areas that have been burned um, since 2017 all the way through 2021. The most recent tree map we have right now is 2016. So he wanted to bring that current with recent fires. And I pass the mic back to Kit. I'm going to get brave here and put you back in presentation mode since this is the last one. Great, thanks, Karen. So actually, what I'm going to do is, Karen, um, could I ask you to turn off your screen share? And I'm going to try sharing one of my screens. Oh, yeah, great. Uh, I'm going to talk about a specific application, though, and I'm going to kind of zoom around in this landscape. So um, if there are any questions, feel free to just interrupt at any time. Uh, I'm going to take us to the RMA dashboard and uh, let's see if I can find that. Oh, there we go. Um, all right. So uh, are you all seeing the RMA dashboard in front of you now? Yeah. Great. Um, so this is that dashboard that uh, that Karen mentioned, and as you can see, this is live, so we're, we're moving around. Um, this is the 2022 snag hazard product that Ben Gannon um, helped coordinate the generation of based on, on Karen's work. And I do want to just real quickly note that pretty much any of the analytical tools that are displayed here on the RMA dashboard um, have their foundation entirely built on land fire data. So uh, none of this would be possible without land fire data under, uh, underpinning it. 
Um, and I actually gave a presentation to the Canadian fire management uh, organization last week and showed them some of these analytical tools. And the first thing they thought is, well, why can't we do this? Well, because they don't have anything like land fire. So um, if you don't have the foundation built, you can't start to, to generate these types of analytics. So I want to just put that out there first, that land fire is the great enabler in all of this. Um, so this is the Cedar Creek fire from 2022. Um, it still has a few hot spots on it right now. Um, it's outside of Wallow Lake on the Willamette National Forest in Oregon. And it's about 125,000 acres. And this particular fire, um, the biggest area of concern was this area of Oak Ridge, uh, which is the nearest town. But you see this little blue triangle here. This is where the ignition actually occurred on this fire. Um, and at the start, this fire was burning toward Waldo Lake right here. And immediately, the local district ranger on the Malamute called in the strategic operations group with a type one team because they knew this was a high risk environment. They had had two snag hazard fatalities or two snag tree strike, I should say, fatalities um, in the last decade here on the Willamette. So they were concerned about that and they knew that there, were, that there had been quite a bit of mortality in this area. Um, but they also knew that uh, with, with winds changing, with um, a lot of variability on this fire and a lot of potential for growth, they did not think they had a lot of opportunity to go at this fire directly. They were going to have to do a lot of indirect line, a lot of work um, kind of on the outskirts to bring the fire to safer, more effective locations. So this fire started by making a run at the lake and then it made a run to the north. And then this huge area over, over here, this is all wilderness. And uh, this area burned out in about two days. So this is about a 35,000 acre burn in about two days, driven by a 70 mile an hour wind. Um, and then the wind did a 180 degree turn and started burning back the other direction. Um, they did very little to try and stop this fire as it was burning into the wilderness, into this area of very high snag hazard. And I'll kind of bring your eye over here. So um, at, using the same color scheme that, that Karen already presented, uh, blue areas are kind of the lowest hazard or areas that are, are white or even basically they're untreed, um, all the way up to this extreme hazard. And so decision makers on this fire immediately looked at the wilderness. They looked at these areas of extreme hazards and said, we are not going to put our fire responders in that area. There is nothing of high enough value to send our people into the, these dense, dead stands. Um, and as you, and you'll note, um, once this fire started burning out this direction and actually started threatening the town of Oak Ridge, um, they, again, didn't really try to focus a lot of effort on trying to stop this fire in these relatively high snag hazard areas. But if you zoom into these areas where they did catch the fire, they were really trying to piece together um, the lowest snag hazard, the highest control potential, uh, the best um, operating environment. Um, some of those are other analytics that we can put onto here, suppression difficulty index. Um, and what they were doing is they were kind of overlaying these fire responder exposure analytics, these probability of success analytics, and trying to figure out where they had the best opportunity to make a safe and effective stand on this fire. Um, what's really cool to see also on here is that there was a ton of pre-fire planning that was done on this landscape. So prior to the ignition of this fire, they had what's called this pod network, potential operational delineations. So they had pre-identified their best available holding features. And during these wind events, they knew that with heading fire, these pods were not going to hold. And so um, as this fire was kind of marching westward toward the town of Oak Ridge, um, they, they knew that these particular pod boundaries were probably not going to hold because they weren't safe. Uh, they were in the middle of snag fields. Uh, they were uh, in the middle of kind of these potential for extreme fire hazard during a, a wind event. But what they basically were able to do is identify these kind of more remote locations where they had the best available control opportunity. And you'll notice the entire western flank of this fire was controlled um, along these pod boundaries that really took into account what is the snag hazard? Uh, what is my fire responder exposure, suppression difficulty? What is my probability of success, my um, potential control locations? So um, all of these products are completely grounded again in land fire data. So we wouldn't be able to show any of this stuff um, if we didn't understand what the canopy characteristics were, what the potential fire behavior characteristics were, um, any of these kind of underlying conditions that help us create these analytical tools. So um, 
I'll leave it at that. Um, the, the I have lots more information about this fire. I did about an hour long interview with a district ranger and was really impressed to find out uh, the decision making that had gone on on this fire and how they had really tried to leverage these analytical tools. Um, and it's really going to help her tell the story of why they got the fire they got and um, how they were able to basically avert the hazard to Oak Ridge. Um, that being said, there's there was still a, a big smoke inundation problem for six weeks. So um, there, there's smoke re remediation is one thing, but they didn't lose any structures, didn't lose any homes, and nobody, no fire responders were harmed um, on this fire either. So um, Karen, do you want to go to your, your last slide and I'll stop sharing? Okay. And I think it just had our contact info. So well, where did it go? I will get there eventually. Um, it, it is the concluding slide. So let's see if we'll advance. No, we won't advance. Um, I will get there momentarily. We can start questions and discussion. And when I can get PowerPoint to cooperate, I will show you that slide. I have a question, Kit. Um, first of all, you must have been super proud to see your tool, you know, like being used in real time. First of all, that's like so great. So congratulations. Um, did you see many other forest managers um, using it this year? Or was this just kind of like, you know, one of the few folks that were trying it out in real time? So uh, what we're seeing is, uh, as with any of these newer tools, is kind of a learning curve and uh, momentum building behind them. So uh, I think the first time this product, the TreeMap product was available, TreeMap, TreeMap informed snag hazard was available uh, at kind of that west wide scale. So it was available to use. Um, I think it was, was it 2020, Karen? Is that when it first was out? Um, and that was using the Landfire 20, or sorry, the, uh, the TreeMap 2014 product um, that didn't account as much for disturbance conditions. And so that was kind of the original beta tool. And people were kind of te test driving it and thinking, you know, this looks cool. Um, but what I'd like to see is disturbance. I'd like to see more of what I know is out there in this product. And that's actually one of the really cool things about something like the RMA dashboard is that it provides that instant user feedback. And so immediately Karen uh, got the feedback that, hey, let's try and figure out how to, to get that disturbance in there. And then she was like, well, we're going to be running the 2016 product and it's, it is explicitly using disturbance as a variable. So let's see what that does for snag hazard. Um, and then last year, uh, we, I think people really liked the snag hazard product where there hadn't been a recent fire but then they just got the pink blob where there'd been a fire. And they're like, okay, well, what's going on inside the pink blob? Um, and so that's when we took that feedback and uh, Ben uh, ran a couple of his kind of magical analytical uh, tools on it uh, that, Karen, that Karen detailed, um, did some regression modeling and was able to start to backfill in on what was actually happening in those recent disturbances as well. So if you look, um, I'll just do a share screen just because we we can talk with the share screen up too. Um, yeah, there we go. So if you look um, at this map up here, this is one of those recent fires. So um, this is what the snag hazard looks like um, in those areas that had just very recently burned. And if you kind of zoom out, you can kind of see these big fires in Oregon. So we know these are areas of concern for operators because we know what the, the general forest type was before it burned. Um, and we know there was probably a relatively high severity event. Um, so we have a pretty good uh, way to, to estimate what snag hazard looks like in those footprints. And is Landfire 2020 being used right now? Or I thought I saw LF 2020 in that list there in the legend. <laughs> Yes, and actually, I think the fuelscape from Landfire 2020 is right here. Uh, yes, um, so uh, the fuelscape is now available for Landfire 2020. Um, I believe that the analytics that were released this year um, for snag hazard and for um, 
well, I'm, I'm sure, I, I don't know that Snag Hazard used this, but um, suppression difficulty index and PCL, uh, we used Landfire 2016 and then we updated it using all known disturbances and fires current to December of 2021. Uh, had uh, the Landfire 2020 product been available when we were doing that updating, we would have started there and then we only would have had to add one year of disturbance. Uh, but that's the way we typically do is we, the, the foundation is Landfire and then we look at all known disturbances, all known fuel treatments and other things and we just kind of update the fuel scape so that it's, it's fire season ready. And I see April's question there too in the chat is related. Are there any planned updates for TreeMap to use Landfire 2020? Um, yes, there are. A thing that's slowing us down right now is we are not um, just turning the crank yet. We're still pushing forward on the research on TreeMap to make it even better. So there's a few improvements we want to do. Um, and luckily, I have some folks coming on board to help me with that because we're, I will say, I'll describe it as a shoestring basement operation over here at TreeMap. Um, it's mainly me and Isaac Grinfell on fractions of an FTE because we do a lot of other things. And we finally have some helpers arriving who are going to help us look at some cool things like looking if we can use the landscape change monitoring system to map recent insect and disease. Um, also looking at mapping those areas that were pink blobs before, how we're going to uh, do that on this go round. So that is hopefully coming soon. And I'm just doing a quick plug here uh, for all of these other highly land fire dependent products that are shown on the RMA dashboard, potentially for a future discussion. Inga. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of our, our current plans for, for Landfire. So our next release is going to begin in um, the spring for um, Northwest and Southwest of the United States. And, um, and it's, going to have everything we can find for disturbance in 2022 in it already. Um, so we're getting to the point now where we are going to be incorporating disturbances from the season before essentially um, in our releases. And so, um, you know, it's, it's gonna be our first pass and everything. <laughs> It's a short turnaround, as you guys understand, you know, that's, that's the biggest issue, but, um, but I just wanted to let you know, because, um, you know, we're also sort of trying to understand how to, um, deal with insect and disease disturbances better, um, because, you know, right now we're, we're basically getting our information from the forest health team and, um, and our own remote sensing process, but, uh, but I think, uh, you know, there could be some, some exciting things to talk about if, if we can get a better idea of the insect and disease stuff too. Yeah. It would be fun to chat more about that, Inga. Yeah, definitely. Because I, I know that um, because I have, I have the actual FIA plot locations, which, you know, requires an MOA, and I know we all have one as well. I'm able to kind of overlay plots that have been affected by insect and disease with the land fire rasters and see that that is in fact under predicted. That's why we're looking at LCMS. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I understand the challenge because in my looking around for like a good, good map of that at the national level, I don't find anything. And there's a lot right. of issues with some of the data sets that are out there. So I think it's been, it's been a major um, challenge as far as, as I know, and I'm sure y'all all know um, more of the gory details around that. So I would be happy right. to Exactly. Yeah. So we should definitely keep in touch on, on our efforts there. Great. And Inga also, I just want to touch real quickly on that uh, integration of disturbance. And I, that is music to our ears for RMA because uh, we have had you know, two or three of us putting together a, an Excel spreadsheet to crosswalk <laughs> recent disturbance, forest type, uh, you know, what does it look like to punch in a quick and dirty change to the landscape? Uh, and understanding sure. that the, the yeah. quality control is not there. And the yeah. work that Landfire does is so much better than the stuff that we're able to put together. But on the ground, it it was the only thing for a number of years. From 2017 to 2020, we were the only, uh, you know, rapid update nationally that was available. And so mm -hmm. fire managers were asking us for, uh, for you know, the, what's the LCP for our region look like this year? And we would send them something. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's, it was yeah. better than what they had, yeah. but it wasn't great. Um, yeah. and so it, yeah. it'll be awesome to not do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's, also, that's the goal. Yeah. Tag teaming onto that. I'm being asked a lot for annual updates to tree map because a lot of folks need those. And that includes a lot of people are using it in the carbon markets and carbon valuation. Oh, right. So if y'all are, I, I have been saying like, well, whatever land fire puts one out, we can put one out. So if you're doing it annually, we'll hopefully be able to just um, piggyback on that and turn the crank. Uh, every year. Yeah, I guess just to Great. temper temper that expectation a little bit is um, we are planning on releasing uh, sort of by January um, to get the West out first and then kind of working our way um, across the country. Yeah. I don't know if Charlie or Sonny were next. Feel free to unmute yeah. yourself and yeah, go for it. Yeah, Kit, um, this isn't about the land fire future, but it's about the product itself. Um, do you just use the disturbances uh, that are incorporated in, in land fire history or do you go back to, uh, for like older fires? For instance, uh, the fire that you were talking about at Cedar Creek, the reason they uh, took on that strategy right away was because it was right on the edge of the old Warner Creek fire from 92, which was one of the first fires in Spotted Owl Habitat, HCAs. And so there was no, no activity to salvage that fire, and it is full of old growth snags. And that's why they adopted that strategy in the first place. So I was just wondering how far back in history do you go uh, with disturbances uh, in this particular product? So actually Karen can speak to that better than I can, I think. Well, that was an interesting echo. There's, like, there's a lion or something. Um, <laughs> so we just start with the 1999 disturbances because we are heavily backing on land fire. I haven't attempted to go back further than that. That's a really interesting thought because we could maybe ingest uh, things from, for example, from WFDIS. But then there also starts to be an issue with, um, with the FIA plots. Um, they changed their, their protocol recently to a national one. I think that was maybe about 10 or 15 years ago. Somebody probably knows their FIA history better than me. Um, so I don't know if the plots we're imputing would be tagged with disturbances that are that old, so it might not buy us anything. But as we kind of move forward in time with both of these data sets, the FIA, now that they're on that, that national protocol and they'll be revisiting every five to 10 years, each of these plots, we're gonna have kind of a deeper history. I, I'll also add to that too. Um, the work that Chris Dunn did uh, in the 2019 paper really focused on the snag hazard within uh, fire perimeters and looking at severity and how that that changes the snag dynamics for different species and different sizes. And you could actually model what died. And then not so much just what was dead after the fire, but how long did it take for those snags to fall? And so that's one of those things where he actually was able to, to track through time, through models, um, how the snag density changes over 50 years of tree fall. Um, and I would be, I'd actually be really curious to see how his snag model uh, or tree fall model would hold up in um, an actual example, like you mentioned here, um, because I think a lot of what the modeling showed in his stuff was that most trees, especially in the Pacific Northwest, because it's relatively wet, um, within 25 years, a lot of the snags have come down. But um, it'd be interesting to see if you walked this, if it was a 1992 fire, if there's still a ton of stuff standing, well, that, that, we need to change that model um, for these drier landscapes, for example, to maybe account for that lack of tree fall. Um, and that is actually something that, um, that Ben was able to start figuring into the 2022 uh, tree map snag hazard product was looking at kind of that decay rate, that fall rate. So um, those 1999 disturbances um, are considered less of a concern than the more recent ones. Um, I don't think anybody else is doing that. I see a question that we might have kind of abandoned from Randy. And I, Randy, I can't answer this, but I bet Kit can. Is it possible to download data from the RMA dashboard? 
Yes, it I think is. That's what you're asking, Randy, when you said this tool, is that right? Yeah, uh, thank you. Yes, yeah, The uh, if you go to the SharePoint site, you can pull down the uh, raster images, you can grab the KMZs, and you can, so fire managers love KMZs. They can throw it immediately into Google Earth and you can fly around inside of it and you can zoom into your strategic location. Um, there are a couple of cool formats that you can grab. Um, and if you're a GIS person, you can actually recalibrate or you can, you can, you know, change it to a percentile. You can actually do some kind of cool ways to re-visualize the data. Great. Well, um, I have a couple more questions, but I wanted to give Sunny the floor. Um, to jump in. Cool, good, thank you so much, Randy. Appreciate that. Um, I was curious if anyone has been doing this on a more local level, like at a countywide level, um, looking at snags where you have a mixture of open natural areas along with higher density urban areas, uh, not specifically wooey, um, but just at more of a localized scale, if anyone's kind of done a similar assessment with snags. Not that I'm aware of. Um, I know there is that, as far as urban areas too, there's that iTree data set that may map urban areas in more detail than, than we're doing. Um, but I'm not, I'm not terribly familiar with that. What about you, Kit? So um, I, I would not bet against that. I'm, I am guessing that there are probably some motivated land managers who have gone out and done really detailed local scale work um, but I, I'm not aware of any specific efforts. Um, <coughs> I know that uh, at the, in the Forest Service, a lot of times the, the hazard is so distributed across these, these very large areas, they tend to resort to uh, remote sensing or uh, aviation or some way to, to get to the data um, at the scale of the problem. Uh, whereas, yeah, I mean, individual tree mapping could even be possible or using LIDAR. Uh, is another way people think about um, potentially capturing some of these data. Challenge with that, of course, is getting the reflights and, and keeping everything up to date and getting the coverage. Well, that was cool. Um, so obviously, um, first responder concerns are the first priority. Um, so I'm really excited for your work in that regard. I'm also thinking about just wildlife. Have you seen people use this for you know wildlife work? Um, snags are so key for wildlife. Um, I was curious about that as well. I could see it even being in for a certification audit, you know, preparations. Uh, I could see a lot of different uses for it that are outside of the fire realm. Again, acknowledging wildfire safety being the first priority. That's a great question, Randy. Um, and I, I don't know of any yet. I don't know of any yet personally. I'll punt that one over to Kit too and see if Kit is heard. Yeah, and I don't know that anyone has used the the snag hazard to fire responders map um, in a publication to to get at the wildlife um, habitat potential. Um, I do know that the original um, EDART product, and then I think also the LCMS product, um, the landscape change monitoring system product that Karen mentioned earlier from Sean Healy, um, people are using those to try and uh, you know map out potential wildlife habitat. Great. Thanks for that. I'll, I'll watch for that. Um, and Karen, when we um, meet to talk about carbon stuff, we can brainstorm on this more. Really, really curious to see what we can come up with. Oh, maybe some bad good. ideas, but also maybe some good ones. That would be Karen, great. I would look forward to that. Um, Karen, I went to oh, go ahead. Um, I'm trying to get around to Jennifer's go. question. Um, tree map is not in the RMA map viewer. I've been trying to get the enterprise data warehouse of the Forest Service to serve it. There have also been some discussions actually with land fire about uh, maybe land fire um, doing that. I'm trying to get you a little demo here um, in ArcMap just to show you what tree map would look like if you want to look at number of dead trees. And let's see if I can share my screen. Sorry, I'm kind of taking control, Megan. Is that okay? <laughs> Totally. Okay. Um, I think I can do a super quick demo here. Okay, can y'all see that? Yep. I know there's a little delay. So this is, I'm zoomed in on the area around Missoula right now on the tree map. 
So this is, if you just look at those plot identifiers, each of those colors is a unique plot identifier. Um, but then there's a number of other, with the new tree map, 2016, this is not true for the 2014. For the 2014, we just gave you that plot identifier. And you needed to go to the FIA databases um, if you wanted to figure out what any of the characteristics were. But for this one, we gave you a whole bunch of attributes in the, 20, in the tree map 2016. So you can find the forest type. You can find that this is a stand size code, um, lag basal area, canopy and stand height. And then there's also fields for what I'm showing you right now is the number of trees per acre that are larger than five inches diameter dead. Um, so that's what we're displaying here. So you can click around and you know get more detail on that besides I just showed it by classes here. Um, but that's that's what you get if you download the raster. I recently a uh, friend asked me about a, a, whether I knew about a snag map. And um, I didn't even realize we were having this office hours today. <laughs> so I was like, I found the one on the RMA um, site and it was it's for birds. So they're interested in it for, you know, for a, a bird oh. study. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I just wanted to make that connection. <laughs> that's very cool. I do want to get to Jennifer's uh, question about NAEP imagery. Um, but before I do that real quickly, I also want to put a plug in. Um, in region five, we have kind of a value added product where we start with the tree map and form snag hazard. Um, and then we use remote sensing to refine it even further. So we bring in that EDART uh, mortality tracker and that's only available in region five. Um, and it's only in the forested areas of region five. Um, but that uh, what, what's critical to that um, and what makes it different than any, anything else is having tree map underlie it tells you what was there first before things started dying. And that's a critical piece of information for making any type of hazard assessment. Um, other disturbance trackers don't tell you what was there before. So if it was a young stand and it died, okay, that's important ecologically, but it doesn't affect fire responders. But if it was a mature stand and a large part of it died, um, that's where tree map really comes in as a strength. Um, so real quickly to that question from Jennifer about NAEP imagery. Yes, we've been exploring uh, Forest Health Protection has a national program where they're trying to use classified NAEP imagery to try and capture um, tree stress and eventual tree mortality. Um, we were told that they might um, have a promising product by the end of last year. Um, it turned out the computational needs uh, of their product were much, much higher than they expected, and they were able to produce um, you know, maybe a, a national forest scale. Um, the other challenge with NAEP imagery is shadowing. Um, oftentimes, the NAEP imagery has a, sh a shadow component to it, and it's very hard to tell what's going on inside the shadow. So you have to have multiple years to look at. Uh, one other good side with that is that the new NAEP imagery that's being flown um, has an embedded LIDAR sensor as well. Now, the USDA is only buying the NAEP imagery, but the, those LIDAR footprints are available every two years for wherever that uh, flyover occurs. It's just that it's an additional cost, and no one's calculated what that would cost to produce nationally. But that could be another way to get at some of the snag hazard considerations. And Jennifer, an interesting like tag team onto that is, I don't know if you know John Hoagland, but he works also at the Forestry Sciences Lab um, with Kit. And he is doing a lot of, you know, I'm, I don't really want to say similar work to treatment, but in a similar vein. But he is, is using pattern recognition um, in a lot of his efforts um, to, do, to do tree lists. And I know he can actually like use the shadow as information, which is kind of cool because that is telling us there's a tree there. So I think he's making a lot of headway on that. And I don't know where he is on, on publishing um, that right now, but I know he's been working on it for, for a while. Thank you guys so much. So very much. I'm really glad I attended today. <laughs> I'd love to follow up with a number of you. So, um, and I'm going to put my email in the chat box too. I've got great interest in kind of have fingers in a couple of these different pies here and there on with 3 dep and and the stereo nape uh and satellite stereo um 
pilot work too with NGA and um, forestry related applications aren't always talked about in some of those uh, camps because um, USGS and uh, <clears throat> some of the folks working on the global, you know, Earth Dem work uh, care mostly about the ground. Um, and, and so they don't tend to address some of the underlying issues with um, dealing with uh, forested areas in photogrammetry. So anyway, I really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. Well, and that's really interesting. I keep saying that I'm expecting LIDAR or some effort like that to make TreeMap obsolete. In fact, I thought that would have already happened. Um, so I think that could be like a new and even better way to do snag hazard, those kind of data sets. And Jennifer, you're in you're in Minnesota. Is that what I'm? Or... Oh yes. Yep. I work okay. for the Minnesota DNR, um, and I'm in a unit called Resource Assessment, and we handle the state's uh, forest inventory program. Uh, we also invest in FIA um, intensified uh, sampling and buy buy down the the time frame to to five years. Uh, so we did double double intensity and shorten it up to five years. Um, we're big advocates for the high precision GNSS work being done with FIA plots, so that all those plot locations are even better well known when you sign that non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> uh, and we're uh, hoping to also expand the center plot of those FIA plots to be just a little bit larger so that uh, we reduce some of the noise problems that we get when we use FIA with LIDAR. Yeah, and actually I, I just found out about Forewarn like two days ago. Uh, my understanding is it's a little coarser resolution. Um, and so I'm not sure how, how well it would mesh with some of these products right now. Uh, the LCMS tool is, is also at that native 30 meter resolution, highly land fire dependent. Uh, and Landsat dependent. Um, and so it actually does mesh really well with this. So um, Karen has talked about maybe maybe the next tree map product will have that LCMS integration and, and who knows um, what that will look like. It'll be an exciting development coming up. To be continued, hopefully within the next few months, we'll have an answer for that. 